Hey guys, sorry this video is taking longer than I thought it would. We've been having some technological issues, but I think we're good. So we're going to be taking a look at imperialism, especially taking a look at uh, the, the annexation of Hawaii, and then taking a look at Spanish-American War, and then the presidencies of Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, remember you got your review session tomorrow night at seven. Uh, sorry, Monday night at 7 o'clock, and so you'll be able to ask any questions then. But let's get started with Hawaii first, and then we'll take a look at the Spanish-American War. Acquisition of Alaska was a cordial affair. Other expansionist yearnings proved more troubling. Such was the case in Hawaii. In the early 1800s, missionaries from New England made the arduous journey to Hawaii to spread Christianity. They misinterpreted the Hawaiian culture, believing that living in a paradise had kept the Hawaiians from progressing. Instead of grasping all he can get, he divides with his neighbor and confidently expects his neighbor to divide with him. While the native Hawaiians were content to live in their traditional ways, a growing influx of Americans was busily building huge plantations, railways, docks, and hotels. They soon dominated the island's economy and made their influence felt in government. In January 1891, Hawaii's native king, Kalakaua, died and his sister, Liliuokalani, ascended to the throne. Although she was educated in the U.S., she rallied against U.S. rule. Hawaii for Hawaiians. In 1893, American plantation owners plotted a revolt with the help of U.S. Ambassador John L. Stevens. When the U.S. battleship Boston arrived, Queen Liliuokalani saw that resistance was hopeless and sadly surrendered her throne. The Americans assembled their own government, with Sanford B. Dole as the president. U.S. Ambassador John L. Stevens reported to Washington. The Hawaiian pear is now fully ripe, and this is the golden hour for the United States to pluck it. President Grover Cleveland, however, opposed the annexation of a sovereign nation and tried in vain to restore Liliuokalani to the throne. After William McKinley became president, Hawaii was annexed in 1898. So as you've seen with imperialism, we have already talked about in class and now through this documentary, a few different expansions that demonstrate America is moving in a more imperialistic sort of uh, uh, trend. Although what you'll probably notice is that this is very similar to Manifest Destiny in the late 1800s where Native Americans were seen as, as blocking expansion. Um, and, and so that was the Native American wars that we were studying in the previous chapter. What you will see, though, is a number of different reasons why uh, the, the imperialist movement is going to be happening. Number one, you've got a number of people who are looking outside the country, both for resources and also they're looking for places to trade. Many also believe that American expansion is, expansion is important. So remember that, that safety valve that we talked about in Chapter 26. There are many newspaper publishers who are arguing that American greatness de uh, demands that America goes in and expands outside the country. And there are many Christian missionaries who are trying to spread especially the Protestant faith overseas um, to other countries. This is going to lead to what's known as imperialism, uh, an attempt to try to build an empire by conquering neighboring countries um, to expand the power of your own home country. And when you study what's going on with this, this is very similar to what we studied with colonization and mercantilism at the beginning of our course. For many Americans, they're also influenced by what they learned about from Charles Darwin with social Darwinism and the idea that there are some groups that are believed to be better than others. Um, and, and then also, finally, remember Alfred Mahan, um, who is going to be important for his book about how the navies are now the supreme force inside the world. Um, and his argument is that if you want to control the seas, you must have a canal through Central America to connect the east and the west coasts. Um, and you also need to be conquer conquering island groups in order to be able to fuel your ships as they try to get to different places that you're trying to influence. For America, they've also got an interest in Latin America, and you've seen that already with the Monroe Doctrine, but that starts getting more aggressive as America starts looking with more places to trade. And they're also nervous that Europeans have been imperialistic ever since the time of the colonies, and America's now trying to catch up with them. So you'll see on multiple, uh, on multiple occasions, we almost come to the brink of war with Germany over Samoa, um, with Italy over the lynching of, of Italians in New Orleans, especially over nativistic concerns. Um, and especially we want to notice what's going on um, with battles between the United States and Britain, 
over Latin America and Britain also having an idea of building a, a canal through Central America for their own reasons. What we're going to find though is we're going to avoid going to war and we're going to have what's known as the Great Reproachment that you see down at the bottom of the screen, which is where Britain and America are going to realize that they are much closer to one another than they are different from one another. And there's also a feeling on Britain's part that the, an alliance between America and Britain would be good. And so we're going to find from this point forward, Britain and America are no longer going to be going to war with one another. And in fact, they're going to form alliances through World War I, World War II, the Cold War, and, and today's war on terrorism. So we're about to see that, that classic battle between America and, and Britain go away. For America, though, what they are very much interested in is expansion into the island groups in the Pacific and the Caribbean, and Hawaii is a great example of that, where Hawaii had already been a place that sailors had known about when they were moving across the ocean, either for, for uh, ocean-going uh, uh, stuff like whaling, or else if they're going out there for trade. We've also got Christians who are, are there who have been working as missionaries, um, and they've we've also got uh, a, a massive sugar production going on, and you've seen that with Sanford B. Dole in your documentary where you've got plantations that are cropping up in Hawaii taking advantage of their tropical climate. Um, you're going to find, though, that the reason why there's a problem with Hawaii is because of the McKinley tariff. There is a, a, an attempt inside this, this tariff bill to try to exclude Hawaiian sugar manufacturers from trade inside the United States by putting up a trade barrier against them. And there are a number of Americans who would like to figure out how to get Hawaii annexed then so that they're not uh, under the subject of the McKinley tariff since they'll be part of the United States. So Queen Lilio Kalani will be uh, 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 toppled by monopolies who are backed up by the military um, in Hawaii, and that will eventually create a large naval base in Pearl Harbor uh, that will allow America to have, have influence over the Pacific. What you also want to notice, though, is Hawaii is very much going to be like Texas um, in its early beginnings where Texas uh, got its independence and then it wasn't annexed immediately by Andrew Jackson and John Tyler. Um, Grover Cleveland is going to do the same because Grover Cleveland is an anti-imperialist, but we'll see in 1898 that William McKinley will have no issue um, with annexing this, this island and making part of the United States. This is going to lead to a number of other conquests, as you can see, going across the, the Pacific Ocean. There's an attempt to take over a lot of island groups, many of them uninhabited. Uh, some of them have sparse in, uh, uh, inhabitation. Um, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to create coaling stations that will allow them to, to reach the Philippines, China, and Japan so that they can then trade in Asia. Our next focus is going to be on the Spanish-American War then, and we're going to find that Cuba brings us into a war where Cuba is going to be rebelling against the Spanish, and for many Americans, they're going to see parallels between that and the American revolutionaries against the British. And so they're going to get a lot of sympathy inside the United States, especially from our yellow journalists. 1901, the influential Admiral Alfred T. Mahan became a military advisor to President McKinley. Mahan was best known for his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. In it, he illustrated how a nation's power is directly related to its naval might. He advocated updating the U.S. Navy fleet, establishing Caribbean naval bases, building a canal across the Isthmus of Panama, and increasing U.S. possessions in the Pacific. The second half of the 19th century found Spain holding tenuously to their empire. Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean the Philippines and Guam in the Pacific. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the expansionist mood was at a fever pitch, with U.S. investments in Cuban sugar and mining industries steadily rising. In 1870, young Cuban Jose Marti had his first success as a rebel. He penned a patriotic poem against Spanish rule. The poem angered the Spanish government in Cuba so much, they jailed Martí for four months and sent him into exile. Unthwarted, Martí continued his political writing, calling for Cuban independence. It is terrible to speak of your liberty for one who lives without you. A wild beast does not bend its knee before its tamer with greater fury. His tenacious spirit provided the Cuban people a national hero and hope of ending colonial rule. In 1894, Martí organized guerrilla actions, destroying U.S.-owned sugarcane plantations, hoping to provoke U.S. intervention in the Cuban plight against Spain. Spain sent an army under General Valeriano Weiler to crush the rebellion. 
Jose Marti was killed, but his revolution blazed on. Frustrated by rebel successes, General Weiler ordered 300,000 Cuban civilians into concentration camps. Thousands died, and the revolution seemed lost. But aid for Cuba arrived from some unlikely allies. Rival newspaper publishers William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer printed stories about the Butcher Weiler. Not out of any democratic zeal, the stories simply bolstered newspaper sales. They tried to outdo each other by printing sensational pictures and stories that fed the hysteria against Spain. Embellished stories like this became known as yellow journalism. Peter Frederick Remington was among the many reporters sent to cover the war. In 1897, Remington arrived in Havana to find there were no battles, no cavalry charges, and no artillery barrages. With no story to cover, he wired Hearst. Everything is quiet. There is no trouble. There will be no war. I wish to return. Some say Hearst replied, please remain. You furnish the pictures, and I will furnish the war. And war did come. On January 25, 1898, the USS Maine steamed into Havana Harbor. Outwardly, its mission was to help quell the conflict between the Cubans and Spanish. On February 15, 1898, Captain Charles Sixby was in his cabin after dinner. His crew was below decks. Suddenly, an explosion ripped through the underbelly of the Maine, killing 266 men. The American headline screamed, it was a Spanish mine. Remember the Maine became a rallying cry as the American public was whipped into a frenzy. While the U.S. Congress prepared a declaration of war against Spain, forces were deployed to the Caribbean and the Pacific. Anti-expansionists protested loudly. They believed the U.S. was in danger of becoming an imperialist nation. U.S. Navy warships moved in to blockade the harbor of Havana, Cuba's capital. And President McKinley issued a call for 125,000 volunteers. Infuriated, Spain declared war on the U.S. Two days later, on April 25th, the U.S. reciprocated. On the other side of the world, in the Pacific, Commodore George Dewey received orders to seek the Spanish fleet and capture or destroy it. The Philippines had been oppressed by the Spanish crown for more than 400 years, provoking many revolutions. When the U.S. declared war on Spain, Filipino rebel Emilio Aguinaldo saw a way for the Philippines to achieve independence. On May 1st, Dewey surprised the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay and sank all 10 Spanish ships. During the next three months, some 11,000 U.S. troops joined with the Filipino rebels to defeat the Spanish. Aguinaldo declared Philippine independence on June 12th. With the Philippines seemingly under control, U.S. troops moved on to capture Guam. Meanwhile, back in the Caribbean, the 9th Cavalry, a unit of African-American soldiers, arrived in Cuba. They found the Army quartermasters totally unprepared for the thousands of troops pouring in. Equipment was disorganized. They were issued woolen uniforms in the tropical heat. Both black and white soldiers were forced to live in unsanitary conditions with poor rations. Diseases such as yellow fever broke out and thousands were hospitalized. Of the 5,400 deaths in the Cuban campaign, only 379 were the result of combat. Teddy Roosevelt quit his desk job as Secretary of the Navy and became second in command of a volunteer regiment called the Rough Riders. They were a motley crew of some 1,200 men, including the socially prominent, cowboys, musicians, and clerks. In a critical battle, Teddy Roosevelt led the Rough Riders on a charge up Kettle Hill. They came under heavy fire, but were aided by the two regiments of African-American soldiers. They sacked Kettle Hill, but at great cost. What a sight was presented as I recrossed the flat in front of San Juan, the dead and wounded soldier. It was indescribable. In short order, the U.S. captured San Juan Hill and seized the Spanish fort 
while destroying Cuban ships in the Straits of Havana. With the situation in hand in Cuba and the Pacific, the U.S. now turned 18,000 troops and a naval escort on another Spanish colony in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. They landed at Guanaca Bay, but before they could reach the capital city, Spain agreed to sign a peace treaty with the United States, putting an end to all military hostilities. The war was over in just four months. The truce with Spain was signed on August 12, 1898. It was a splendid little war, commented soon-to-be Secretary of State John Hay. It may have been a splendid little war, but it left a distasteful legacy. On December 10, 1898, the Treaty of Paris was signed, giving the United States the right to occupy Cuba with full control over Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. In the Philippines, Emilio Aguinaldo and his supporters were angered as one colonial power was replaced with another. On February 4, 1899, he declared war on the U.S. forces in the islands. It was a brutal war of massacre and torture, with U.S. forces taking on an ugly role, forcing Filipino civilians to live in areas where disease, hunger, and poor sanitation killed thousands much as the Spanish under Butcher Weiler did in Cuba. In the end, more than 20,000 Filipino rebels and some 4,000 Americans were dead. At home, anti-imperialists complained that the war's purpose was to free Spain's colonies, but the result was the U.S. becoming an imperial power. The famed American writer Mark Twain sarcastically noted, there must be two Americas, one that sets the captive free and one that takes the once captive's new freedom away. Ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court decided how new territories would be handled. Puerto Rico became an incorporated territory, allowing Puerto Ricans to become U.S. citizens and the right to vote on statehood. On the other hand, the Philippines remained unincorporated. In 1902, Filipinos held elections for their House of Representatives, a first step on their long journey toward independence. While the Filipinos were struggling to gain independence in the Pacific, a similar battle was being waged in the Caribbean. In 1900, the Cubans wrote a constitution. Fearful that another country would dominate Cuban affairs, the U.S. Congress insisted that Cubans add provisions known as the Platt Amendment, which limited Cuba's rights to make treaties and permitted the U.S. to send troops into Cuba to keep order. Cuba became a protectorate of the United States. So your big takeaways about the Spanish-American War is America is going to enter into a conflict in Cuba largely because of the fact that they are they see themselves as the protectors of revolutionaries, but also notice that there is a, a an economic element that's going on as well. Americans owned large plantations that were producing sugar that were also affected by the large tariff that was created in the late 1800s. For the Cubans, they're going to be hoping that the United States will be able to come in and help them to remove Butcher Weiler, the the, the uh, governor of, of Cuba that was appointed by the Spanish. And he is doing horrible things. So he is creating concentration camps. He is starving people. There is disease. There is all sorts of, of terrible warfare that's taking place. And in America, this turns into a, a celebrity sort of situation with yellow journalism where, where Hearst and Pulitzer are going to be writing these really sensational stories about what's going on with the freedom-loving Cubans and the horribly oppressive Spaniards. And so they're whipping up a war frenzy here inside the United States. When the USS Maine was sent to protect Americans inside of Cuba and then it blew up mysteriously, that is going to agitate everybody in the United States to want to go to war who is feeling imperialistic. Now, sadly, we discovered about a decade ago that the Maine didn't blow up because of a mine. They blew up, It blew up because of an accident inside their ammunition magazine. So we're going to end up falsely accusing the Spanish for blowing up our ship. But this will create a Pearl Harbor or a Fort Sumter style moment where the United States will jump into a conflict to try to protect the Cubans and their right to independence. 
when we take a look at, at what's going on with the war then, there's a lot of anti-imperialists who are going to argue that this is just a war of aggression. So notice one of two amendments that you want to be noticing with the, the Cuban portion of the Spanish-American War. You want to notice the Teller Amendment. The Teller Amendment is going to announce to the world that America is only coming into Cuba to protect the right of the Cubans to have independence, and we're going to walk away from the country after the war is done and allow them to have freedom. The war then starts in 1898. Many Americans saw this as an opportunity to be able to prove their manhood and, and fight in the war. Um, and so we're going to see that in this war, it's a very quick war with a Navy that the United States has that far outreaches what the Spanish have since the Spanish have become a, a declining power uh, since the early part of your textbook. The war is going to be very brief, like the, the battle at Manila Bay, uh, where the United States is not going to lose a ship. They'll blow up the Spanish Navy that is located there, and the only American casualty be, will, will be one person manning a gun who dies of heat exhaustion um, because they're overwhelmed by the heat with the guns going off. When we take a look at what happens then in Manila Bay, though, the people in the Philippines believed the United States when the United States said that they were coming in to free the people who had been su subjugated by the Spanish, but that doesn't apply to the people in the Philippines. Instead, the United States views these guys in the racist terms of being our little brown brothers, where they argue that these guys are not able to govern themselves, and they need to have protection instead from the United States. For the United States, there's a couple different mentalities going on. Number one, the Philippines can serve as a gateway to China and Japan. And number two, if the United States pulls out and leaves the Philippines independent, they could be dominated by other imperial nations that can look at them as a very weak area that cannot defend themselves. But in spite of all those different things, Emilio Aguinaldo is going to feel betrayed, and we're going to go from the Spanish-American War to the Philippine-American War right afterwards. In Cuba, the war is going to be very brief. Uh, people like Teddy Roosevelt will form their own private volunteer groups um, called the Rough Riders in Teddy Roosevelt's case um, so that they can go and fight in the war uh, so that they can achieve glory and manhood and, and whatever. And so we're going to find that this war um, is going to be a, a very quick war. It's going to be a war that is very much made up by volunteers. Um, and we're going to find that those volunteers are doing some things um, that are going to lead us towards a more professional military by the time we get to World War I because of some of the mistakes that they're going to end up making. For the Rough Riders, they gain a lot of acclaim in, in Cuba. Um, what's ignored at the time is they're being aided by an African-American regiment that is doing a lot of the hard work to allow these guys to have a glorious uh, uh, set of victories, especially at San Juan Hill and Kettle Hill. Um, in spite of that fact, though, Cuba is going to fall very quickly, so will Puerto Rico. Um, and the United States is going to get the, the Spanish to sign an armistice very quickly. Um, we're going to find, though, that inside this war, there's a few things you should be noticing. Number one, malaria, typhoid fever, dysentery, yellow fever are killing more soldiers than are killed in, in, in battle. And also they're eating rotten meat. Um, and there's going to be an impetus. There's going to be a push for us to start getting more medically proficient um, because of the number of people who die during warfare because of diseases that could be prevented. So we're going to see this jumpstart our medical profession, try to figure out how to sort out these diseases. In the treaty that is made in Paris, what's going to happen is Spain is going to give up its American and Pacific colonies. And the United States then is going to have the opportunity to figure out what they want to do with those territories. What we want to then be able to understand is with these different places, they're going to all be treated differently. The Philippines are going to be engaged in a rebellion against the United States once they realize that the United States is not going to allow them to have independence. Emilio Aguinaldo will start fighting back against the United States, and in this war it becomes pretty controversial about what the United States is doing since they are not setting them free for a bunch of different reasons. We're going to find then that with the United States, they've got an issue also with these territories because many of these territories do not nationalistically look like Americans inside the United States that are modeled by the late 1800s vision of social Darwinism. And so for these, for these countries, they are populated by people who are black, who are Filipino. Um, there's concerns about whether or not they can actually truly become Americans. And so we're going to find that this is going to lead us into a full-blown debate after the war is done about what to do with these territories. You have imperialists fighting, battling against anti-imperialists who are saying that this the war and taking over new territories is not right for a whole host of different reasons. But we're going to find that imperialism is going to take off from this time forward with Teddy Roosevelt and beyond. What we will find, though, is in these territories they're going to be treated differently. So just by being conquered does not mean that these countries are then truly American and on equal footing. 
First of all, you should know about the insular cases, I-N-S-U-L-A-R, which is a, a series of cases created by the Supreme Court that said that the Constitution does not necessarily follow the American military when it conquers territories. So for the people in Puerto Rico or the Philippines or Cuba or Guam, they don't have the same rights as the United States until so the United States defines what they're actually, uh, what they actually are in respect to being a territory or, or a state. Um, we're going to find that for Puerto Rico, they will become part of the United States with the Four Acre Act, um, where they get a limited self-government, but they are also a territory of the United States, and they are allowed the opportunity to vote to become a state if they would like to do so. What we find nowadays is that the Puerto Ricans are, are currently um, uh, inside of, a, of the American sphere, which is why the, the response to the most recent hurricane has been some, so troublesome. Puerto Rico is still wrestling three months later to get their electricity back, but they are truly Americans, as are defined by the insular cases. For Cuba, Cuba is going to start off with the Teller Amendment, but then they're going to add later on the Platt Amendment, which is going to say that while the Teller Amendment said all the Cubans would be getting independence, the Platt Amendment reserves the right for the United States to step in if they want to, if they feel like the Cubans are not governing themselves well or they're under threat from becoming uh, conquered by the Europeans. And so this is going to become a very limited independence with America serving as their overseer. The Cubans are then forced to agree to this. They want to be truly independent, but they're not going to be allowed to do so. The United States will also retain territory, and the most important territory you should notice is Guantanamo Bay, um, which is st currently still a military base, and it's currently being used as a, a place to house uh, the people that are suspected of terrorism in our war on terror, which is a, an element that we'll study at the very end of our course. For the United States, with the Spanish-American War, America is able to demonstrate to the rest of the world very decisively that they are a very powerful nation and that the rest of the world should then pay attention to us. And you can see that through the negotiation groups that come from Britain, France, and Russia that are going to send more representatives to the United States so that they can then engage in negotiations with the United States. For the Philippines especially, what we want to notice though is that this war in the Philippines is going to be a very bloody war. Um, and it's a very controversial war. For many Americans, they're very troubled by what they see happening there because there are things like torture and other sorts of elements that are going to become elements of the, the Philippine War. One of the most famous of the, the tortures is going to be known as waterboarding, where they would take water, pour it over a towel over somebody's face, and give them the sensation of drowning to get them to give up information about other people who might, might be hiding in their revolution. Um, both the, the, the war itself... Um, to, to subjugate people who wanted dependence, and then also the use of torture um, gave this a very mixed sort of feeling for the soldiers that were overseas. For many of the soldiers also um, that were sent from the United States, they're volunteers. They're not acting professionally. There are a number of abuses that take place. And so we are going to subjugate Emilio Aguinaldo and his revolutionaries. They are going to become part of, of the American group. Um, where they are going to be forced to become part of the United States sphere of influence, but they will not become a territory or the state. Instead, they're going to be governed by the United States until they're fully prepared to have democracy on their own. This is where William Howard Taft will become famous. He's going to become the governor of, of the Philippines. He's, he's somebody who wants to govern them well. He's able to help them uh, uh, rebuild after the war is done. Um, and this is where his claim to fame comes before he becomes president. For McKinley, what he is hoping for is he is hoping that the, the Philippines will then adopt the ideas of the United States. Um, but then there's also the issue of the fact that, that, uh, that they are racially different than the people in the United States. And if they were in the United States, they'd be facing all sorts of racism and discrimination. So McKinley's benevolent assimilations can be really tricky um, when you're taking a look at how the Philippines are going to be assimilated. We're next going to take a look at, at the jumping off point. So the Philippines allow America to then jump off and look at China. And so we're going to be taking a look at the open door policy next. As the 20th century opened, China was in turmoil. Corruption was widespread. Opium addiction was endemic. Rebellion, drought, and famine claimed the lives of 60 million Chinese. Foreign nations had divvied up the empire into spheres of influence. Areas where one country had exclusive rights to trade, invest, and had special political rights. With a coaling base in the Philippines just 400 miles from China, American businesses hoped to take advantage of China's vast resources and sell to her vast market. John Hay, then U.S. Secretary of State, had a brilliant idea. 
he sent letters to all the foreign powers suggesting an open door policy in China. This policy would help U.S. businesses by guaranteeing equal trading rights for all, preventing one nation from discriminating against another. At the same time, the open door policy maintained the territorial integrity of China, an idea that appealed to anti-imperialists at home. Other powers politely put Hay off, saying that while an open door policy is a good idea in principle, they had no way of enforcing it. However, Hay, despite the debate, boldly announced that everyone had agreed to the policy. Everyone, that is, except China. Su Si, Empress Dowager of the Qing Dynasty, was eager to rid her empire of these foreigners. In northern Shandong province, a secret society known as the Fists of Righteous Harmony attracted thousands of followers. They too wanted to rid China of foreign influences, but they also sought to throw off the yoke of the corrupt Chinese government. Foreigners called members of this society boxers because they practiced martial arts. Boxers believed that through meditation and discipline, they could cloak themselves in a mystical shield, so foreign bullets could not harm them. The Empress welcomed the boxers as China's defenders and turned their fury squarely against the foreign community. In June 1900, the boxers began their bloody campaign. They murdered hundreds of foreign missionaries and Chinese Christian converts, destroying millions of dollars worth of property. About 900 foreigners blockaded themselves in their embassies for nearly two months, repelling waves of boxers. Ammunition, food, and medical supplies were almost gone. Then shortly before dawn, loud explosions rocked the city. Weary defenders staggered to the barricades, expecting a final, overpowering boxer attack. But instead, relief had arrived. Troops from Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and the U.S. fought their way into Peking to free their countrymen and put down the rebellion. The boxers, believing they were impervious to bullets, were cut down by the thousands. On September 7, 1901, China and 11 other nations signed the Boxer Protocol, snuffing out the rebellion. Now, as a U.S. history student, you haven't been taught a lot about Asian history, uh, European history, global history. And so one of the things you should realize is China and Japan have been rivals against each other for decades to this point. And recently at this point in history, Japan had defeated, uh, Japan had defeated China um, and China had become a declining power. You remember Japan was opened up by the United States. They started industrializing and militarily they're able to dominate the much larger neighbor to the West. When that happened, Europeans also saw an opportunity. And with China, they had millions of people living inside the country they could be traded with. And China, for the longest time, had a closed society that would not allow foreigners even onto their soil uh, without permission. But now they were too weak to be able to stop that from happening. So by the time we get to the open door policy during Teddy Roosevelt's presidency, we're going to have instead uh, a, an opening, uh, sorry, by the time we get to Teddy Roosevelt's presidency, America is going to find that Europe has taken over all the ports over in China, but they want to be able to get into that trade as well. They're going to engage in something called the Open Door Treaty. And the Open Door Policy or Open Door Treaty is going to announce that for the United States, they're going to make deals with the Chinese to trade with them. Um, but the United States is going to have access to every single one of their ports, not because they're asking for permission, but because they have the military power to be able to enforce that. McKinley is going to start to put that in play first, and then Teddy Roosevelt is going to reinforce that quite a bit. In 1900, we're going to then have the Boxer Rebellion, where foreigners are going to be attacked by the people inside of, inside of China who are feeling nativistic. They are very much nationalistic about their country. They love China. They think it's the greatest place on the face of the planet. And they're very angry at these foreigners who are coming into their country who are attacking their culture and attacking their rights. Um, for these boxers, though, they're going to be very much outgunned when it came to, comes to this war. And so the Europeans and the Americans are going to pull their forces together and squash this rebellion that is going to lead to then China being uh, opened up for trade. For China, then, they are going to find themselves at the mercy of Europeans and the United States. They'll become a trading partner 
Um, and, and this is going to become a bone of contention because the Japanese are going to want to have control over China during the same time period. It's that challenge between China and the United, sorry, Japan and the United States over who has the influence over China that's going to lead into our conflict in World War II. And it's also one of the major reasons why we see China as such a, a threat nowadays because they still remember um, the time period where we were essentially trying to carve them up um, when they were in a weakened state. And so they're very much, much more powerful nowadays um, and looking to be a competitor with the United States because of that traditional history. When we take a look at William James Bryan, then he is going to be the president in 1900. He gets re-nominated and he beats William James Bryan yet again. Um, during the campaign, McKinley is going to do fantastically well in this election, both with election votes and with money that he's still getting from large business owners who want to, to keep uh, on McKinley's side. And now that the economy's turned around, William James Bryan's ideas do not make sense um, with economy that's booming. And so the people who want radical change to our economic situation are not going to be able to get much attention during an election like this one. So for the Republicans, they're going to win this election. But one of the weird things that they decide to do is that they decide that Teddy Roosevelt is too popular to be the governor of New York, especially after inv being involved in the Spanish-American War. He's a reformer who is pushing for reform in one of the largest cities inside the United States. So what the Republicans decided to do is they decided to make Teddy Roosevelt the vice president of the United States for William McKinley with the idea that McKinley was so popular he would never face any sort of danger. Now, the problem with William McKinley is he's going to be assassinated shortly after the election in 1901. There's going to be a guy named Leon Chelgatz who is going to uh, uh, kill William McKinley. And the story is really sad. William McKinley is going to be in line at, at the, the World's Fair that's happening in Buffalo in September 1901. Um, and while he's shaking hands, this guy is going to step into line with a towel wrapped around his arm. And inside that towel is going to be a gun. Um, the Secret Service is going to recognize that there's a, a guy there with a gun. They're going to cut in front the person. Uh, sorry, they're going to realize there's a guy in line with a towel around his hand. They're going to confront him about the towel, but they're not going to examine it. And the guy's going to claim that his hand got cut, um, but he still wants to meet the president. When he got to the front of the line, he shot McKinley twice in the stomach, um, and McKinley ended up dying. Um, in a weird uh, twist of fate, then, the reform president who was put into the vice presidency by Mark Hanna so that he would uh, not be a, a threat then uh, for engaging in reform and become a, a, a popular presidential candidate, um, instead becomes the president of the United States and brings in two different ideas. He is very much a militarist who is an imperialist and a nationalist, and so he believes that that war is a good thing to, to prove the greatness of a country, but he's also a progressive, so we're going to find in upcoming chapters he is very much in the idea of changing the Republican brand towards a more involved government that can reform the situation that we have here in our country. He believes in the big stick diplomacy, where he says, speak softly but carry a big stick. Um, and for Teddy Roosevelt, he is a larger-than-life figure, so once he gets in the presidency, he is very much somebody who loves being in the presidency. He also believes in using the bully pulpit, which means he believes that instead of waiting to find out what the public wants him to do, he believes in being aggressive and then convincing the country afterwards that he is the leader who's got them on the right path. So let's take a look at what Teddy Roosevelt's up to with his presidency. Foreign policy at the turn of the century was characterized by three vastly different philosophies. Theodore Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy, William Taft's dollar diplomacy, and Woodrow Wilson's moral diplomacy. Theodore Roosevelt abided by the African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick. He applied this big stick theory to American foreign policy, believing the U.S. should take a strong role in Asia. In 1905, Roosevelt intervened to end the war between Russia and Japan over Korea and Manchuria. When Japan was angered by racist sentiment in the U.S., Roosevelt arranged a gentleman's agreement. He would see that Asian discrimination ended, but in turn, Japan would have to limit Japanese immigration to the U.S. In a show of growing U.S. naval might, Roosevelt launched 16 warships on a world tour. Painted brilliant white, the flotilla was known as the Great White Fleet. The tour was a triumph. The U.S. was regarded as the most potent naval power after the British. In the interest of connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, Roosevelt turned his attention to a narrow strip of land in Colombia, the Isthmus of Panama. 
In 1903, Roosevelt's Secretary of State John Hay failed in an attempt to negotiate a treaty with Colombia for the land. But U.S. interests were not to be denied. Roosevelt backed a Panamanian revolt and negotiated for the Panama Canal Zone. Work began. Massive locks were designed to raise ships through the mountains and then lower them on the other side. 1.53 million cubic meters of concrete were poured. 70,000 workers recruited and $400 million was spent. A marvelous engineering achievement, the canal was finally completed in 1914, just in time for World War I. In 1904, Roosevelt wielded his big stick again, adding a corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Initiated in 1823, the Monroe Doctrine established a policy to limit European expansion into the Western Hemisphere. Roosevelt's corollary went further. It stated that the U.S. had the right to intervene militarily to keep European powers out of the Western Hemisphere. The Roosevelt corollary was exercised the very next year in 1905 in order to relieve the Dominican Republic's debt to threatening foreign creditors. In 1909, when William Howard... Ten so Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy is very much about the idea that the United States is a strong country, he believes it's a good country, and that America should be stepping in to try to spread American ideas around the world. He had, uh, agrees with Alfred Mahan, and so he's going to build a Panama Canal. And as you can see right here, the Panama Canal is going to be slicing through a mountain range in the, in the Central American territories. Now, what Teddy Roosevelt is going to do, though, is Teddy Roosevelt is going to use his big stick diplomacy. He's going to use gunboat diplomacy, and so he is going to build a canal, and he's going to try to negotiate with Colombia to try to get them to allow the canal to be built. Now, we've got a treaty that's already on file at this time called the hay Ponsfo Treaty um, that is going to be coming into effect. We had already signed the clayton Bulwer, um, which agreed that we would not... Uh, create our own American canal, but we created a brand new treaty that allowed the United States to dive in and start uh, building a canal, but they weren't really sure where. America decided that they wanted to build a canal through Col uh, Colombia and offered them $10 million to do so. The Colombians came back and they said that they were willing to talk about this deal, but they wanted more money. But Teddy Roosevelt believes in big stick diplomacy. He asked them once, gave them a deal, and instead he parked a gunboat off the coast of Colombia and encouraged Panamanians to rebel, and in return for their protection of, from the United States, they would then create this, this canal for the exact same deal that was being offered the, to the Colombians. So for Teddy Roosevelt, he is going to build this canal, even though legally there isn't really an agreement about whether or not what he did was legal, whether or not he could start building this canal. His feeling was that it was better to uh, go ahead and build this thing and then ask for forgiveness afterwards than asking for permission and possibly have this thing uh, bogged down inside of Congress. For Teddy Roosevelt, he is going to be somebody who then is able to build this, this canal, but it also creates a lot of hard feelings because a lot of people in Latin America are going to see T Teddy Roosevelt using the power of the United States to bully countries in Central America. This canal is going to get built um, very quickly. Um, and one of the large successes they have is not just building this canal through a mountain range, but also they start figuring out how to get rid of diseases like yellow fever by eliminating the mosquito population that's nearby by draining their swamps. This is the appearance that Teddy Roosevelt has, though, inside the Caribbean, where he starts looking at the Caribbean um, as being his own personal bathtub, especially using his great white fleet, his navy, to be able to dominate the countries that are in the area. For Teddy Roosevelt, then, when we take a look at the Panama Canal, he will say that this is one of his greatest accomplishments. And if you take a look at what the canal does, um, using this graphic right here, you're going to see that the graphic um, is, is showing you something that's amazing. This is a whole mountain range that got flooded by the canal system. This is a lock and dam system. A series of elevators will lift up boats into the, the inland sea that has now, uh, inland lake that has now been created. And then ocean going boats can go through this inland lake to the other side where there are our lock and dam sequences that will then lower the boat down to the other side where it can then re enter the Pacific Ocean. And so for Teddy Roosevelt, he has no doubt that what he's done is good, um, even though it's controversial at the time. For Teddy Roosevelt, though, what you want to be noticing about him is his Roosevelt corollary, where he is going to announce that not only do we have the Monroe Doctrine, but he is worried that there are Latin American countries that are close to becoming colonies once again. 
The technique that Europeans are using with them is that they will give them loans, and when the, these countries cannot repay their loans, the country that extended the loan is going to try to come in and use that as a reason to conquer the country itself. The Roosevelt Corollary says that the Latin American countries are then under American protection. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe from domination. All it means is that if a Latin American country ends up in debt, instead of the Europeans being the ones who can collect that debt, um, the United States is the ones who get to collect the debt instead and use it as an excuse for them to be able to come in and dominate that country. So for Teddy Roosevelt, it's going to give a, a feeling to Latin American countries that when the United States offers to help, it's not necessarily altruistic. Instead, it's something where they can expect to be dominated as a result as a part of the imperialism. And you've seen that already with a number of different countries. For Teddy Roosevelt, he will use that policy in, in Cuba. He'll use it in, in places like the Dominican, Dominican Republic. Um, and, and Teddy Roosevelt will have very little problem uh, flexing his big stick. For Teddy Roosevelt also, he is going to become uh, one of our presidents who wins the Nobel Peace Prize uh, because he will end the war that's happening between Russia and Japan in 1904. Um, but this war is telling for a number of different reasons. Russia and Japan went to war over many different places like Manchuria and Korea, and Russia had believed uh, that they were ethnically superior to Japan, uh, and so they had provoked a war, and Japan, having already highly industrialized to a level Russia, had, Russia hadn't achieved, started pounding on Russia heavily. And so Russia and Japan are, are in full-blown war, but by 1904 they would like to get out of the war um, and they're seeking help from the outside. So in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt is going to offer to mediate a, a deal to end the war. Japan wants to end the war because they want to focus on imperialism in the Pacific. Russia just wants to get out of the war because they're tired. So at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, they're going to negotiate a treaty where Teddy Roosevelt will bring together both sides um, so that they can end the war. But then after the negotiations, Teddy Roosevelt will bring his great white fleet to parade out in front of all of the delegations so he can demonstrate to all of them what his big stick looks like. And in fact, he's going to send his entire Great White Fleet around the planet once so that every country can understand that the United States is, is powerful enough to reach everybody in the world. So when we look at the Pacific Coast, we're going to find that inside the United States, there is a wave of immigrants who are going to be moving into the United States. There is a lot of racism on the West Coast of the United States, especially in San Francisco. Um, we're going to have backlashes taking place. And this is going to lead to what's known as the Gentleman's Agreement, where Teddy Roosevelt is going to try to limit Japanese immigration um, to try to prevent that sort of racial backlash from happening inside of our country. When you take a look at this map, then, this is the reason why you've heard me over the past couple of weeks uh, commenting about uh, uh, President Trump's commentary about uh, about the state of nature in Africa and places in the Caribbean and other sorts of places. Um, when when the president describes many of these places as, as not being as developed as the United States using the, the profanities that he is alleged to have used, um, part of the reason why this is a controversial statement is for anybody who knows history, um, many of these countries were being dominated by Europeans or by the United States to, to be used for, for their resources and military gain. Um, and then largely they were left to their own devices in relatively recent history. And so for many of these countries, they're going to suffer quite a bit as a result of the impact of, of what's taking place there. So we're going to find that with Teddy Roosevelt, he is going to be involved in, in trying to figure out ways to negotiate with Japan, like with the Root Takahira Agreement, where they are both going to uphold the open door policy and respect each other in the Pacific. We're going to be engaged in other sorts of conflicts uh, that are taking place with the, with the Roosevelt presidency. But now let's take a look at Taft and Wilson um, as we wrap up what's going on with imperialism with these guys. In 1909, when William Howard Taft succeeded Roosevelt as president, he established a foreign policy encouraging U.S. investment in Latin America and China as a way of discouraging European investment. In contrast to Roosevelt's big stick policy, this new policy became known as dollar diplomacy. As a result, U.S.-owned businesses came to dominate the economies of many small nations in Central America, the Caribbean, and parts of South America. Latin Americans reacted with anger and resentment, but they were powerless in the face of the U.S. military. In 1913, Woodrow Wilson succeeded Taft as president. Wilson offered yet another approach to foreign policy. He rejected big stick and dollar diplomacy in favor of a moral diplomacy, applying a moral standard and not recognizing any government that is undemocratic or hostile to U.S. interests. In 
To protect U.S. business interests, Wilson rallied troops to stabilize Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba, effectively turning them into U.S. protectorates. Wilson encountered failure in his dealings with Mexico. In the late 19th century, corruption in Mexico was prevalent, escalating with the assassination of Mexico's president, Francisco Madero, in 1913, and the assumption of power by Victoriano Huerta. Not wanting to support a government by murder, Wilson refused to dignify Huerta's government. I am going to teach the South American republics to elect good men. President Wilson mobilized U.S. Marines to capture the port of Veracruz in Mexico. Although split over allegiance to Huerta, Mexicans were united in their opposition to U.S. invasion, and war was barely averted between the two countries. In 1916, when Mexican rebel Pancho Villa raided a U.S. border town and killed U.S. citizens, an expeditionary force of 11,000 men, under the leadership of General John J. Pershing, crossed into Mexico to hunt for Villa. After a year-long pursuit, Pershing's expedition was called off, but the affair increased anti-American sentiments. U.S. troops withdrew in 1917, and tensions eventually eased between Mexico and the U.S. The United States forcibly entered the new century as an imperial power. In little more than a century, a nation founded on freedom discovered itself embroiled in troubling relationships with the peoples of its new territories and protectorates. Despite the turmoil, America had forged from its historic isolation a newborn world power. The elements that you just saw about Taft and Wilson will be covered in your upcoming chapters. Chapter 28 will take time to talk about Teddy uh, Wood, uh, sorry, William Howard Taft's dollar diplomacy. Chapter 29 will take time to talk about uh, Woodrow Wilson's. But what you notice with all of them is, is an increased involvement of the United States in other countries. And while they are going for many different reasons, whether it's military purposes or economic purposes, uh, cultural purposes, um, oftentimes they will claim that they're coming for, for altru altruistic reasons to bring democracy and freedom and American values. Oftentimes it's coupled with the idea that the people in a country are needed to assimilate like Americans in order to be fully treated as, as uh, uh, people who are relevant to the United States. But still, we will find that those interactions are oftentimes imbalanced um, for the purposes of helping out America's uh, uh, positioning inside the world as a foreign policy power. Um, that will then elevate the United States, but it's also going to create a lot of hard feelings that we're going to see emerging then over the course of the 20th century, and we'll be exploring those in the rest of our course. For you guys, then, if you have any sort of questions or problems remaining after after the stuff that you've seen so far, feel free to post questions. There'll be a, a posting board available very soon um, on your Schoology page so that you can start updating questions. And again, Monday night, 7 p.m. is when we'll do our review session. Enjoy your three-day weekend, and uh, and good luck with your studying.